Uh, OK. Now I want to talk about multivariate polynomials. And I also need to bring up a confusing point that, you know, it's confused me for a while, which is that it's very important uh, to distinguish between um, formal polynomials and the functions that they compute. So every polynomial, uh, and I'm going to start talking about multivariate polynomials, although this admonishment also holds for univariate polynomials, compute some function uh, uh, mapping n field elements into a single field element. And it is a fact that it's not hard to show that every function is computable by some, like this is computable by some polynomial. And it uses the interpolation method that we did last time, well, when we were talking about analysis of Boolean functions. It's not quite the same thing there, because we're doing it um, for like plus or minus one values over the reals. But the idea is the same. You can easily write down a polynomial, which computes the value 1 at your um, favorite uh, tuple here and 0 elsewhere. And then by taking a suitable linear combination of them, you can get a polynomial that computes your favorite function mapping n field elements to one field element. Uh, but check this out. Uh, how many different functions like this are there? You can do this. Pardon me? Q to the n. Not q to the n. That's the number of elements here. Q to the q to the right. There exists q to the q to the n such functions. And how many polynomials are there over the field fq in n variables? Infinitely many, that's right. Right, because the polynomial is just, you know, like a list of coefficients and like the degree can be as large as you want. Okay, that just clearly shows that there are some functions that are computable by multiple polynomials. Uh, actually, all of them are computable multiple polynomials, but there's some function that has, let's say, two different polynomials that compute it. And now if you subtract those two polynomials, you'll get another polynomial, and it computes the function which is constantly zero. But it's not the constantly zero polynomial because, well, I imagined you took two distinct polynomials. So uh, what I'm trying to say is there exist, like, formally non-zero polynomials that compute the all zeros function. OK, and so this, this is why you have to really be careful when you talk about, in some sense, the zero polynomial. Um, because there are non-zero polynomials that compute zero everywhere. And uh, here's a, a simple example. x squared minus x in f2x. Okay, this is a non-zero polynomial, like it's of degree 2. It's got coefficients 1, minus 1, and 0. But if you plug in any number from f2, and there's only 2 to plug in, 0 and 1, they both output 0. Okay, so this is like a non-zero polynomial computing the 0 function. Or more generally, x uh, q minus x in f x. These are just univariate examples, even. Uh, the fact that this is always 0 when q is a prime is Fermat's little theorem. But uh, this is even true in the non-prime fields. Uh, so that's something to watch out for. But on the other hand, uh, there's some nice uh, observation we can make using just this fact. This fact tells us that um, in fq, x to the q always computes the same number as x. That's what this is saying, to say that this is always uh, 0. So it means if you have a polynomial, uh, even a multivariate polynomial, where the field is fq, 
If you ever see x to the q, you can just replace it by x, and you'll be computing the same function. Or if you see x to the q plus 10, you can replace it by x to the 10, and you'll be computing the same function. Okay? So more generally, uh, whenever you have a multivariate polynomial, with uh, fq being the field, you can reduce all the powers on the variables down to below q by you know, repeatedly reading this rule that x to the q computes the same thing as x. OK, so that's a sort of corollary of this observation. Given any polynomial p with coefficients in fq, you can reduce each like xi to the m to xi to the m mod q without changing the function that's computed. You certainly change the polynomial, but not the function it computes. And once you do this, all the individual degrees are less than q. Yeah. Let me say at most q minus 1. Same thing. Uh, good. By the way, uh, one sec. Um, you have to be a little bit careful what you mean when you talk about the degree of a multivariate polynomial. Usually degree means total degree, which means uh, the degree of the highest monomial, the sum of the powers in the, like the monomial that has the highest sum of powers. Uh, but here I'm talking about individual degree, like you look at all the variables, and like every variable itself will have a degree that's at most q minus 1. But the monomials can have degree larger than that. You had a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so. Like, if q is 2, then uh, you're saying you can always reduce the exponents mod 2, which is like saying, uh, oh, wait, maybe it should be, actually. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, good. So. Okay. So. Yeah, so therefore the number of reduced monomials is like q to the n, if they're n variables. So for example, if q is 2, it means you can reduce everything to a multilinear polynomial. All the powers are at most 1. So as we've seen before, there's like 2 to the n possible monomials in that case. And therefore, the number of like reduced polynomials, well, you have a choice of one coefficient between, uh, well, in the field fq for each monomial. So it's q to the q to the n. And this is the same as the number of functions. So uh, actually, this implies that every function is computed uh, by a unique reduced polynomial. Okay, in particular, if you have like a reduced polynomial, this means, again, one where all the, the individual degrees are at most q minus 1. Um, it computes the zero function if and only if it's the zero polynomial, for example. Okay, so there is a generalization, as I mentioned before, of this uh, degree mantra fact to multivariate polynomials. And it comes up a lot in theoretical computer science, and it's called the Schwarz-Zippel lemma. It's basically about the fact that like a non-zero polynomial cannot be cannot take on the value zero too often. Okay, so this was proved by Schwarz, Zippel, or 
DeMillo and Lipton, but somehow only Schwartz and Zippel got their name on it. Uh, okay. And it says the following. Let's say you have a polynomial in n variables. The field is FQ. Uh, and let's say it's a reduced polynomial. So we you know, got all the individual degrees down to uh, q minus 1 or less. And it should not be the zero polynomial. And let's say its total degree is at most d. Then if you pick random inputs for it, the result is rarely zero. So like, I'm going to pick n uniformly random inputs from the field, alpha 1 through alpha n. And I'm going to plug them into p. And I'm going to tell you that this is not zero with at least some probability. And let me just say, what is this probability? It's some certain function, which I'll tell you eventually, of q and d. OK, but the idea is that um, this polynomial is somehow often non-zero. So uh, before telling you what this function is, let me tell you what it is in some cases. So case one, which sometimes you need, is when q is 2. So you have like a multivariate polynomial mod 2. You pick a random input for it. In this case, uh, this function is uh, 1 over 2 to the d. OK, so it says there's at least a little probability you'll get a non-zero answer. It's at least 1 over 2 to the d. This is the least main, less, lesser case. This is the main case, so I'll put like a big star. Case 2 is when you have a big field. This is like a big degree, small field. Now we're going to talk about big field, small degree. So we'll talk about q being uh, bigger than the degree. And in this case, the function that you could put on the right-hand side is 1 minus d over q. In which case, you know, you feel like a better way to write it is that the probability that the polynomial uh, does output 0 is at most d over q. Okay, in particular, if q is way bigger than d, this is like a small number. And so um, in a very big field, a degree d multivariable polynomial uh, rarely outputs zero. Also, this fact doesn't make sense if the field is an infinite field, like the rational numbers or something. But uh, there's a version of it which makes uh, sense in any infinite field. So, in fact, also um, for any subset of your field, if you pick your alphas just randomly from this subset. then you can put d over the size of the subset here. OK, so you don't even have to pick your field elements from the whole field. You can just pick them from like a big enough subset, and it'll still be true. And you can use this if like, you know, the field is the rationals or the reals or something. Um, OK. The reason I didn't write the uh, function in general is it's like kind of complicated. And you may never need it, but in case you ever need it, here is the, the function itself. It's 1 over q to the floor d over q minus 1 times 1 minus d, I, I, I don't remember this, d mod q minus 1 over q. So you can check that this is the same as uh, these two things in the special cases I told you. But um, you use this if you know q is like 3 or 5 or something, or 4. It gives you, for small q, it gives you some kind of like uh, generalization of this fact that like it's, there's a reasonable chance it's non-zero. And one may ask, how do you prove such a thing? And it's not that hard. Maybe it'll be on the homework. Maybe not. Um, 
Well, the univariate case, the n equals 1 case, is basically the same as the degree mantra. And then the general case is like a boring but straightforward induction on n. OK, so let me end by telling you uh, an application of schwartz zippel And this application is the problem of finding perfect matchings in a bipartite graph. OK, so I give you a bipartite graph with n vertices and m edges. You want to know, is there, a bipartite, or is there a perfect matching in it? And um, if so, you'd like to find it. So it's a very easy and old fact that you can do this in order m n time. It's not very hard. Probably you've seen it before. You basically do BFS like n times. But what's uh, open still is, can you do it efficiently in parallel? So is there like a polylog and time uh, parallel algorithm for it? And this is still open, but uh, Lotsi Lovas in like a 79 showed that the answer is yes if you allow randomness. Okay, and uh, in two minutes I'll show you how to do that. By the way, it was recently a big result from 2016, uh, Fenner, Gurjar, and Theorov, that you can do it deterministically with uh, polylog depth circuits, but quasi-polynomial size circuits. So they got it in deterministic quasi-NC. Uh, OK, so what's the Lovas algorithm? Hmm. You know what? Just to excite you, I'm going to not do it because I only have like two minutes left and I don't want to go way over time. But it'll be in the notes. You can see it. Um, the story is, given the graph, you construct a matrix uh, with indeterminate entries. And it's easy to show that the determinant of this matrix is zero if and only if there's no perfect matching or the determinant is a non-zero polynomial if and only if there is a perfect matching. And so to find out if there's a perfect matching, you just start plugging random numbers in for the variables in this matrix and take the determinant, which Victoria Chanky showed in like 1976 does have an efficient parallel algorithm, taking a numerical determinant. And then the schwartz zippel lemma says that if this is like a non-zero polynomial, which is equivalent to there being a perfect matching in the graph, there's like a high chance when you plug in a random number, you'll get a non-zero answer for the determinant. So the whole algorithm is just form this matrix, plug in a random number, compute the determinant in parallel, and if it's non-zero, the graph has a perfect matching, and if it's zero, the graph very likely doesn't have a perfect matching. Okay, so you can see the details of that in the notes, and we'll talk about uh, error correcting codes next time.